Hello and welcome to this tutorial on how to use your X-Rite Color Checker video target. I'm Ollie Kensington and I'm going to be showing you how you can use either the Passport version or the full size color checker or the XL or in fact any of the various sizes of X-Rite Color Checker video target that you might have in post-production with your software so that you can maximize the quality and the accuracy of the images that you are capturing on set or on location, bringing back and getting the perfect image in post. And this is the most important thing about this chart is it is useful in both production and post-production. So I'm gonna take you through all the different facets of it, how you can use it, and hopefully you will see for yourself at the end of this process, just what fantastic and accurate results you can get every time by using this humble color checker video target. So let's start by looking at the exposure chips. The exposure chips are the white, gray and glossy black section of the chart. In the Passport version that I have here, we have a middle gray, so we have an 18% gray, which uh, gives you a reflectance of around about 45 to 50 IRE. We have a 90% reflectance, which is the same as 90 IRE on your Lumascopes. And then we have the glossy black, which in theory should be zero. You do have to be careful that when you're on set or on location capturing the chart, that you get your second AC or talent or whoever's holding the chart to orientate it so that it isn't getting any reflections and is therefore as black as it can be. That will help us a great deal when we get back into uh, post-production. The other thing to be aware of is that it is where your talent is, where your subject is, so that you're not measuring or exposing for the light that's somewhere else. Even just moving it slightly closer towards my light or just slightly further away, I'm gonna be getting different readings there. And it's important that I'm balancing for actually where my subject is. So if we were using it here, which of course we did, then we would have it right next to my face when we were adjusting the balance of that particular shot. The other thing to um, bear in mind is that when you're exposing for this, my advice would actually just to mainly rely on the 90% reflectance. If you're used to exposing using middle gray, then by all means use the middle gray one there. For me, I find it much easier to see where the 90% reflectance chip sits when I'm looking at a waveform monitor on location with my camera there, because it's right at the top. It's much easier to spot them in the middle or somewhere where there might be competing things that are also in those mid-tones. But it is completely up to you, and it depends how isolated the chip is from the rest of your scene. Also bear in mind on the larger color checker video target, you also have a darker gray, which sits more around the sort of 20, 25 IRE. So it's a much lower level of reflectance and it actually gives you an additional step of gray between the glossy black and the, the middle gray that we have here. So when you're exposing, and, and I will use the 90% one as an example, you want to set your waveform monitor to be as bright and clear and easy to see as possible on your camera, and simply adjust your exposure until you see this top section here sit on 90 IRE on your waveform monitor on your camera. It's a bit hard to see if you've only got histograms, but in theory, if the histogram has its x-axis labeled as IRE, you should see a little bump, a little spike, uh, and get that at 90. The waveform monitor I find easier because you can see where objects are from left to right, which makes it much easier. Do also bear in mind that 90% reflectance lands at 90 IRE when it's exposed correctly for Rec. 709. So those of you who sat there thinking, well, I always shoot log, there's two approaches to that. There's the hard way, which is to learn where 90% reflectance drops to in that particular curve or a much, much easier way is just to do this with your camera set to Rec. 709 first. It's easy then, because 90 sits at 90, which is easy to remember. And then once you've exposed it correctly for Rec. 709, simply go in the menu and then change your gamma curve to whichever log curve you want to use. The exposure will not be wrong now that you've changed your gamma. The gamma do changing doesn't mean that your exposure has changed. So simply exposing it first and then changing your log gamma is really a very straightforward way of doing it. The white balance part of this is particularly important. This surface here, this, this substrate that they print this on is incredibly high tech actually. It's really not a simple thing to print a completely pigment free surface. Um, they use graphite with a, it's crazy what they do, but they go to extreme lengths to make sure that what they're giving you here is always guaranteed neutral. 
Um, if there's pigments in a surface, so loads of people always say, well, why don't I white balance from a white piece of paper? Well, paper has lots of contaminants in it, and there'll be an awful lot of blue pigment that our eyes can't see, but cameras are pretty good actually at picking that up. Those pigments are actually gonna mean that the results are offset from true neutral. So having a surface that's guaranteed to have no pigments in it like this is really the most sensible way of approaching it. You want to, as best as possible, and this actually depends on your camera, but normally fill the screen or at least have a target area falling within this and you can sample from it and then the camera will actually reorientate its whole image, the whole color matrix gets reoriented around that correct white point, um, whether that's blue, yellow, Kelvin or green, magenta or whatever axis. Um, that is something you can't achieve by simply dialing in the Kelvin yourself on your camera. All cameras have a way of manually setting the white balance. When you do that, it samples and it corrects itself on all axes. If you manually dial in the Kelvin, you're only adjusting the blue yellow, so you're not gonna get as accurate result if you do it that way. So once we've white balanced properly with our chart and potentially check the focus if we're using the passport um, and we've used the exposure side here to make sure we've nailed our exposure, the other part here, and this is the really exciting part, is we have these color references and also uh, black and white references here. So along the bottom we have uh, three different whites. We have our glossy black and also some matte blacks. All of these chips, these um, various different stops, so six stops, you actually have seven on the larger color checker. But um, these are all basically to help you refine your exposure later on. And I find this is perfect for getting your exposure bang on. These are really good when you're trying to match cameras because each camera's gamma is gonna be very slightly different. How they get from black to white is gonna vary ever so slightly. Whereas um, these will get you to pin 90% white and pretty much get your exposure exactly where you need it these in post can be compared between cameras and actually see the differences of where each camera is plotting these values. And then with a curve, you can simply adjust so that both cameras plot these in exactly the same place. So great for matching contrast between two different cameras. We've then got our skin tone or flesh tone chips. These are incredibly useful. Flesh is a very specific color. Skin is a combination of the yellow color of melanin and then the color of blood, the, the veins and the capillaries and all of the flow of blood underneath the surface of the skin. And that falls in a very specific place on a vector scope. By having these references here, which you can see are arranged in different ethnicities, you can check that your talent skin falls in this range of broad, um, various different color hues. They're all very slightly different, but they all fall roughly along the flesh tone line. And if you see a significant difference between where these are falling and where your talent is relative to them, then you know that something's gone slightly wrong when you are either color balancing or, or balancing based on this chart. So these skin references are very useful. And then finally, we get to the most important part of this whole chart, actually. These are the primary and secondary chromaticity coordinates for REC 709. Um, a bit of a mouthful there, but it is incredibly important that these are specific to the REC 709 chromaticity coordinates. You may have been presented when you were shooting on location or on set with an x right color checker classic, Perfectly decent chart, but optimized for photography, and the RGB and CMYK chips on that are actually different. If you hold them side by side, you can see they're obviously different. These will fall on a vector scope at the correct coordinates for where REC 709 um, primaries and secondaries should be. The x right Color Checker Classic won't. And if you try and make them fall in the right places on the vector scope, you'll end up with an, uh, an image that's wrong. So do make sure that you are using a video chart if you are trying to balance out video. It seems obvious, but I see loads of people using the classic charts by mistake. What we're gonna do is we're gonna capture this. Well, here we are, look, capturing it with this camera. We're gonna take this. I've actually got some footage from a um, shoot that we've done recently. Uh, there's a model with, uh, it's a fashion shoot. We has, she has her dress on in the location. We're using the charts. I'm gonna show you how in post-production you can take this information that you've captured. And remember already in camera, we've used this really effectively to nail our exposure, nail our white balance. But I'm gonna show you how you can actually go that step further with these references to actually iron out the subtle differences between each different camera sensor and the way that the sensor actually reads color and its unique color matrix to that particular manufacturer. So we're talking about quite a, a deep level of adjustment and refinement of the image that 
really is all made possible by this very simple, uh, relatively inexpensive, but hugely valuable tool. So here I have two shots. You can see that we were using the slightly larger color checker, more or less exactly the same. One very useful addition that you have on the larger chart is you have these desaturated uh, chromaticity coordinates. That's very useful for when you are working with cameras that are struggling to maintain hue accuracy in shadow areas or highlight areas, so desaturated areas. Uh, I do know it's a bit of a problem with the particular manufacturers' DSLRs, their mirrorless cameras actually. Um, you will see that even if you get the saturated chips accurate and terminating in the correct place, there's a slight deviation as you get nearer the middle of the vector scope, which is in fact where your desaturated colours and, and brightnesses will be, and they slightly bend or you'll see they're plotted somewhere differently. What's useful about the larger chart having these desaturated chips is you can actually see that a lot more easily because you have those additional chips and you can then account for that and you can actually correct those out as well. It's a really kind of deep rabbit hole with this chart. It's, it's quite complex what you can achieve with it and I always think that people uh, assume they're relatively basic but you can you can achieve a huge amount here. I'm going to leave that for today. I'm just going to concentrate on the main uh, saturated parts of this. But in fact, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure, even though we white balanced from this chart on location, I'm just going to make sure that the camera has read that correctly. And as we've moved back away from the chart, because remember we would have moved in to fill the frame with our camera to white balance, just a, a guarantee that as I've moved back, there hasn't been maybe an introduction of some light bouncing off something that maybe I was blocking. It's very easy to do to accidentally block some light when you're holding the chart or you're there with the camera. So I'm using this as a second opportunity to make sure that white point is absolutely guaranteed correct. Very simple to do. In DaVinci Resolve here, I'm going to use the uh, little white balance pipette, which is in the bottom left hand corner. And I'm going to move up to the screen and I'm just going to click on it. Before I click, I've actually got here my RGB references on and it's showing you my red, green and blue values. And you can see that blue is low relative to red and green. Green is slightly lower. That shows me automatically that there's a slight yellow tint here. So there's, it isn't quite right. So if I just give that a click um, and if I make sure that these RGB values are on again, you can actually see now 194, 193, 193, 194. They're all basically now level. When you have equal amounts of red, green, and blue, you have neutrality. You have gray, you have white. If it's 255, 255, 255. If it's 000, zero, zero it's black. So on an RGB scale, you can easily tell if something that's meant to be gray, black, or white is in fact gray, black, or white by just hovering the RGB picker over it and, and just checking. It will show you that in the values. So by giving that a click, we can see straight away that we've got a slight shift, very, very slight, but just a slight shift towards blue to completely neutralize that. That's why I always record the gray card as well as balance from it. But now for all the exciting bits, I'm gonna to go to the main side of the chart. Let's turn our RGB pickers off now so they don't distract us. And I'm gonna start by adjusting the contrast. The easiest way to do this is to make sure in your scopes, and I have my scopes open here, is to make sure that my scopes are set to Y. Uh, you can do an RGB waveform, but if we're doing Y, it rules out any um, possibility that you might be accidentally confusing your um, chips that are for exposure with, enough, with a different part of the chart. Um, you can colorize them or you can turn them off. I find it easier to focus on just the Luma with the colorize turned off. And although I can clearly see there's the 90% white there, there's my glossy black, it's, it's kind of difficult. The others get lost a bit in there. To help me, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to draw a mask or a window, as they call them in Resolve, around a section of my exposure chips in the middle of the chart. I'm going to use my highlight button to highlight just those parts. The rest of the image goes grey. So you can do that by clicking the little uh, sort of magic wand here. Or if you've got a panel like I have, there's a highlight button on it. And that then immediately makes it very obvious in the scopes where those parts of the exposure chips are falling. Now in terms of where I place them, it's actually quite simple. I want my 90, so that's the 90% reflectance chip right at the top, to be 
around about 896, which is marked here. Just bear in mind that in DaVinci Resolve, you cannot change this scale on the waveform monitor. It's actually a data scale showing 1024 shades per color channel. So basically it's a 10 bit scale. Um, even though you might be working with eight bit footage, this Y axis never actually changes, which is a, a little bit confusing potentially. Most other programs would have this labeled as IRE, which would be zero to 100. So um, it might be confusing, but just uh, bear in mind that 90 IRE is gonna be around about the 896 uh, code value. My bottom chip here, so I'm gonna do that one next. I'm just gonna grab my lift and I'm gonna bring that down to just above zero. Now I tend not to place it exactly on zero, just experience tells me that if you place the glossy black chip on exactly zero, so if I were to place it say there, it does tend to end up looking too crushed once you come out. I think that's because even if you manage not to capture any reflection in that glossy chip, it is normally slightly elevated from a true you know, digital video black. So I tend to just sit it just on top of zero or thereabouts. And I grab my uh, gamma now, and I'm gonna just move those two chips in the middle. So we have a, essentially a, an 18% reflectance, which is a middle gray, which is somewhere around about 45 to 50 IRE. So it's gonna be somewhere around about there. And then we have another one that sits normally around about 20. You sometimes have to push and pull because of the roll off between your lift gamma and gain, you will pull one and it will affect another to a certain extent. So you might have to do a little bit of tweaking, but as long as you're roughly in this kind of arrangement by the time you're done, you should find, if I turn my highlight off, I'm actually gonna turn my uh, mask off, so I'm just gonna turn that off here, and that will apply that change to the whole image. So you can see we've gone from this to this. Now, if I look at my waveform monitor, I can actually see that a big chunk of the right-hand side of my frame over here has actually now disappeared off the bottom of my scope. So you can see it was up there and now it's actually gone down there. That's called crushing. Uh, as soon as we go below that zero level, we actually lose all detail in those blacks and that's crushed out that detail. The reason why that's happened, you can actually see, if I turn it off, my glossy black is actually slightly slanted in fact, if we look at all of them, they are slightly higher on the left-hand side than they are on the right-hand side. The reason for that is actually quite simple. The light source, just like now, is off to one side. So when you're holding the chart, the side that the key light is on is gonna be brighter and it's gonna fall off slightly as you move from one side to the other. That's perfectly normal. It's just something you need to account for. And I haven't accounted for it because when I've adjusted it, I've actually placed my mask over on this side, which is the lighter side of the chart. If I were to move that over to this side and turn my highlight on again, you can actually see now that it's now going underneath. I need to lift it up to there. So it's about learning which is the best part of the chart to actually isolate before you do it. Or if you're not isolating at all, if I turn the mask off, just using a little bit of common sense, looking at your scopes and just thinking, well, what is the darkest thing in the image? There, there is actually no data over here anyway, because it was a... Uh, it wasn't lit, this, this side of the frame. So I am gonna place my black there, but I, I think you, do, you have to learn to not be a complete slave to the chart, but at the same time, understand what it's showing you so that you know when to deviate from it slightly. An image like this that's got a very deep, dark area in it, you will often find that sometimes the glossy black doesn't quite truly represent actually the blackest thing in your frame. If you have a generally light or bright image and there's nothing really deep black in it, then that glossy black often is perfect reference to use as a deep black. You, you learn as you do this more and more what you can and can't do and, and where to slightly deviate from the kind of the, the by the book approach. So I'm happy with my contrast now. I'm then gonna create another node. So I'm just gonna hit uh, Alt S just to create a, an additional node here, or I can use my add serial node button on my panel. And I'm now gonna focus on the color. So with color grading, we always focus on contrast first and then color. So I've got my contrast in here. I'm gonna do my um, color in here. And, and in fact, I've just realized that I've forgotten to copy across my white point adjustment from over here. So the way I'm gonna do that is I'm simply gonna come back to my gray clip. I'm gonna choose the node here that I created the white point adjustment, copy that. I'm gonna create a new node at the start of this chain using Shift S. I'm just gonna copy and paste that in there. So Command V on a Mac or Control V on a PC. So I've now got my um, 
white point adjustment, I've got my contrast adjustment, and then I've got a new node here which I'm going to use to create my colour adjustments. If I just do one last full screen, so we've gone from this to this so far, and now in this last node I'm again going to draw a window, and we're going to turn on our highlight mode again. The vector scope needs to have this on, show two times zoom. If that's not on, then these uh, references, these are the chromaticity coordinate boxes here, they won't line up correctly with where you're actually trying to send your signal. So it's, it's quite important that you have that two times zoom turned on. Um, you can turn your flesh tone indicator off if you want to, it doesn't matter, and just make sure that they are bright enough so that you can see them nice and clearly. I find it's useful to have colour eyes turned on for this, but it doesn't really make much difference. I'm just going to come out of here. First thing I'm going to do actually is I'm going to arbitrarily just push in some saturation into the image. So I'm just using the saturation uh, control on my panel. That relates to the saturation control at the bottom of my interface. Just to broadly get the, the spread of colours up nearer the boxes that we're aiming for, which are these chromaticity boxes here. These are the Rec. 709 primaries and secondaries. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use my curves. Now, I can actually do this very quickly using my panel because there is a curve section and I have specific access to my hue versus hue and my hue versus sat controls. And there are presets along the bottom for red, yellow, green, cyan, blue and magenta. If you're doing it without a panel, if you're doing it directly in your interface, that is replicated along here. So I can click and I can add these control points along the bottom, which adds anchor points at the primary and secondary points along the, um, the, the hue graph, essentially the hue curves. And then I can adjust them either by selecting them and then adjusting the hue uh, rotate. If I do it that way, it will very precisely go up and down and it won't move left and right. If I try and grab them on the screen, that's fine, but you might accidentally deviate left to right and that would actually slightly uh, move your controls one way, maybe a bit more towards magenta or a bit more towards yellow. So what I tend to do is select them down here and then just rotate them. And what we're looking for here, you should hopefully see in the vectorscope here that the actual reds are now uh, changing their angle and I want them to point towards the boxes and, and red was already there to be honest. Yellow is only very slightly off. Incidentally, this is a great way of learning just how good your camera is. Uh, people talk about the colour science of a camera. This is a great way to actually quantify that. If you've white balanced your image perfectly, recorded a chart, and then you're seeing these all over the place and still wrong, it actually shows you how good or not very good your camera is uh, at recording colours accurately and placing them where they should be. Um, you'll also see with most cameras that as you change your different gammas, and certainly if you change your gamuts, but if you change your different gammas, so if you move into log or rec 709 or wide dr or hyper gammas or anything like that, you'll see how it changes the camera's ability to place these references in the correct place. There are certain compromises that come with going into log with a camera that sometimes come at the expense of colour accuracy. It varies from manufacturer to manufacturer, but this is a great way of actually quantifying that and knowing how to fix it when you get your footage back into post-production. So I've done my yellow and green. Let's go into green here. Hue rotates. This one's quite off. You'll often find green and magenta are the weakest just because of the nature of how you debear an image. The processing in the camera will often be least accurate on the green magenta axis. Uh, if I come into cyan, that's actually pretty much in the right place. Blue is slightly off. Let's come up here. And magenta is slightly off. Let's bring that down here. The next thing to do, and I'm going to do this from the panel just because it's quicker for me and quicker for you sat here watching me, is I'm going to go to the hue versus sat and I'm just going to now adjust the saturation. So it's the same graph essentially, but we're now adjusting how far out, now we've got the angle correct, how far out these points terminate. Sometimes you increase the uh, saturation and you realise that actually the angle was slightly more off than you realised. So sometimes you could have go a bit back and forth. Um, let's get blue where it belongs, let's get magenta where it belongs. And you can actually see, it wasn't too bad, green and magenta are the weakest. Again, same reason as before, it's that debearing, it's inherent in that process. 
And if we go over to the hue versus hue, again, we can see green and magenta are the worst offenders, but actually very little to do here. Um, the camera I was using, in case you're interested here, is a Canon C200. Uh, it's one of the reasons I use this camera, actually. I find that it is often very small deviations from what uh, technically is considered ideal. So it, basically the, the color science, the color accuracy of that camera is very, very good. But it doesn't matter which camera you're using. It might be big changes, it might be little changes. What you know when you've done this, when you look at that vector scope, is you know that this is now 100% accurate. The middle point is balanced. That white point has oriented the color matrix correctly around that middle point, which is zero saturation for a vector scope. And as we move out towards our 50% saturation line here, we can see all of these saturated primaries and secondaries falling exactly where they should be. If I now uh, remove my window, which will enable that to apply to the whole image, we can see now our final image. So this is the ungraded or uncorrected image and this is my corrected image at the end. You can see that the model's skin looks more healthy, more vibrant, more saturated. It's, it's hard for you to know you weren't there, but trust me, I shot this. This dress now looks exactly how I expected it to look. This is how it was on the day when we shot it. My screen is calibrated, so I know that I don't need to question whether or not the screen is accurate. Always calibrate your screen as well. We use the i1 Display Pro to make sure that this is accurate. So I know the scopes are telling me this is correct. I know that my eyes are telling me it's correct. I know that the monitor isn't lying to me because it's calibrated. And, and I know that that is a completely technically accurate image that I can then build on top of. There's nothing to say that's it. I could now build on top of this with a creative look that I'm working on. But that foundation, that technical foundation underneath it that's been achieved with this low-tech, simple, throw it in your bag and forget about it device, I think is invaluable, really, really invaluable. Let's just stick that down, come into my color page, and all that work has been done here. I can just simply, with one strike of the key, bring that in and apply that correction to the whole image. Now, this particular image has actually been shot raw, so um, it needs an additional node on it. So I'm just gonna stick this noise reduction on here. This is because there are no, there's no noise reduction applied in camera when you're shooting RAW, so it's normal to have to adjust it yourself. So I'm gonna apply that on there. There we go. And there we've got my final image, so my ungraded and my graded image, entirely based around what we've known from the chart, where those references should live, where we've put them to. And hopefully, as you can see, you end up with an entirely accurate image, particularly important in this case, in a fashion shoot, where we want that dress to be 100% representative of how it actually looks. So people don't go out and buy it and then say it doesn't look anything like it looked in the video. Her skin looks healthy. The colors we've pushed in on set uh, look correct, look accurate. And we're really happy with the overall finished effect from our uncorrected to corrected image at the end. Now you'll remember the skin tone chips that I mentioned, just as a final check, just to make sure this really has worked. If I create one more node, I'm just gonna come and make a selection from our talent's face here. So I'm just gonna select parts of her face. And if we go down to our vector scope, let's turn our flesh tone line back on, our skin tone indicator, you can see if I click on her forehead or on her cheeks, you can see that it's making selections all around the flesh tone line. So it's all in the correct part of the image. If I make more bigger selection, you can see very, very comfortably falling, straddling that flesh tone line. You will find that's completely natural to have slightly yellower skin pigmentation and representation in the shadowy areas, so on the neck. Uh, sort of the back of the cheeks and then just falling to the right of the flesh tone line. We can see that falling there where we have the sort of pinker sort of areas on our forehead and our cheeks. If we want to verify if, if, if that's correct, what we can do is we can actually copy that node, that selection, because that's an arbitrary selection. The computer doesn't know we've just selected a face. It simply knows we've selected this combination of hue, saturation and luminance. If I come back to the chart here and paste on that selection, and then turn my highlight back on, sure enough, we can see that we have her face, her skin, and all of the flesh tone indicators, the skin tone swatches on the chart, all selected and nothing else. Now, obviously, if there was something else in the shot that was skin colored, that would appear. But this verifies for us and, and sort of reassures us that actually every 
step of that corrective process we've just taken has landed us in a situation which you really, really want with a, a memory colour like skin, that it is 100% correct. You may well be sat there watching this thinking, hang on, I thought there was a feature that did all of this for you. I'm now going to show you that built-in feature. And I want to just stress this is nothing wrong with the software. There's nothing wrong with the process that's been put in place for this. I honestly don't know why the results aren't what I would expect to see and correct. Uh, I don't really want to get into that. But I do think that I should highlight that the results that you get here in the process I've just shown you are more accurate than you will get with the automated process. So I'll show you that automated process and you can see and judge for yourselves which is the, the better and more accurate final image. So um, I'm just gonna go back to my chart clip and I've just created a version. So this is the manual version. This is the one, in fact, I'll relabel it. So if I right click version one, rename, and let's call this manual. And then my version two, I'm gonna rename this one color match. Okay, so if I load up my second one, I'm going to come to my color match. Uh, this is this button here. I'm going to make sure I've got the color checker video active. And up here, I'm going to turn on my color chart overlay. And the idea is that I simply match this target up to let the little boxes fall around the chart swatches correctly. Let's just zoom in a little touch. So we want each one of these to be in the middle of the swatch that it's meant to be measuring. Okay, make sure it's not slightly out like that. It needs to be bang on in the middle like that. It will then sample. So the idea is that it will then take a sample from that little middle box in each of these, compare that to know what, it, what it's meant to be like, what it's meant to be a correct image, and then it will update the image accordingly. We'll get a read back here that will tell us a percentage variance of how wrong it was. So the source gamma for this, um, this is now in Canon Log 2, this image. So I know that that's uh, the gamma that we were shooting with. I want to target Rec. 709, that's, that's what I'm outputting to. So target color space and gamma is Rec. 709. And again, I shot this. I know that the color temperature of the light that we were using to, uh, to, to shoot our model was 56. I'm now gonna hit match. You can see there's only a small variation. It's sort of uh, you know, showing a 3% change here. Nothing's kind of higher than 20%. Most of it's around sort of 10 to 15%. So it's a subtle change and clearly it looks different as well. This is the other thing, you know, we turn a sort of before and after and you can see it looks clearly different. So it'd be very easy to assume that it's, it's corrected it. But the problem is, as we can see, that's the way I did it manually. And that's what the auto match has just done. You know, you can, you can see it's, it's just a million miles away from where it should be. So this is my point with the color match feature. If you're led to believe that that's the correct way of using the charts, if you've actually specifically bought the color checker video target in order to use the color match feature, I know it takes a bit longer or seemingly takes a bit longer doing it manually with the curves, but as you can see, by the time you've fiddled and gone, oh, well, that doesn't look right and you've tried to correct it, you actually will find, particularly if you're using a panel, that you can correct it manually much quicker than the color match feature. And one is 100% accurate and one is just, just miles away, you know, absolutely miles away. So do bear that in mind if you're using the color checker and try and stick to the manual method if you possibly can.